Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are. Welcome back to the third day of the Tenure Facility Learning Exchange 2020 on Community Resilience and Land Rights Progress. Uh, my name is Fred Pierce. Um, you may have seen me the previous day. I'm a London-based journalist on environment and land rights issues, and I am, again, your moderator. Um, I hope most of you uh, were able to take part in the past two days' sessions, but whether you did or did not, here are some reminders. First, please keep your microphones and video turned off. Uh, this is, among other things, to protect your and our bandwidth. Second, to receive interpretation, please click on the interpretation button on the bottom of your screen and then choose your preferred language. We have English, Spanish, Portuguese, Bahasa Indonesian and French. And third, if you wish to ask questions of the speakers, please use the Q&A button again on the bottom of your screen. Um, I will put as many of your questions as I can to the speakers in the panel session later. After our focus yesterday on South and Central America, today we have two each from Asia and Africa. We will see video and hear speakers from India, from Nepal, from Mozambique, and from the Democratic Republic of Congo. But first, uh, we have two uh, set piece addresses. The first is from Abdon Nabadan, formerly the Secretary General and now on the National Council of Amman in Indonesia. You probably know Amman is the world's largest national Indonesian, in, excuse me, indigenous organization. He's also on the tenure facility board. You may remember he gave, our, uh, gave us a wrap up at the end of day one, uh, but he's come back to give you more. Um, so Abdon, over to you. Uh, selamat malam. Uh... Saudara-saudariku masyarakat adat dan para peserta learning event. Uh, hari ini saya akan me menyampaikan uh, beberapa pikiran uh, tentang partnership dalam kaitan uh, ekosistem aktor yang bekerja dan berjuang di dalam menjaga atau menjamin kepastian hak-hak masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal. Tentu saja tema ini menjadi sangat penting karena di hari pertama kita sudah berdiskusi dan belajar bagaimana mitra tenur facility merespon atau menghadapi situasi pandemi COVID-19 dan kita menghadapi situasi itu dengan beragam situasi tapi pada umumnya kita dengan kekuatan yang kita punya dengan kemampuan yang ada kita merespon situasi itu dengan dengan baik yang kedua di hari kedua kita sudah berdiskusi dan belajar membahas uh, tentang betapa pentingnya kontribusi masyarakat adat dan komunitas, komunitas lokal dalam upaya mitigasi perubahan iklim global juga dalam pelestarian keanekaragaman hayati. Uh, presentasi dari uh, David, David Kambovic, meyakinkan kita bahwa masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal adalah aktor sangat penting dan kunci menyelesaikan berbagai persoalan yang kita hadapi secara global saat ini. Nah, tentu saja studi-studi itu, data-data itu telah menempatkan masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal di dalam berbagai perundingan di tingkat internasional untuk merespon situasi isu-isu global yang terkait dengan perubahan iklim, keanekaragaman hayati, pangan, air, dan isu-isu uh, penting lainnya. Nah, kita sadar bahwa kepastian hak atas tanah bagi masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal itu menjadi kunci dan menjadi prasyarat untuk tercapainya uh, uh, 
apa kontribusi yang yang optimal dari masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal di masa depan. Nah, hari ini kita akan belajar bahwa eh, harapan global itu ya sangat mungkin kita lakukan kalau masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal membangun kemitraan yang lebih kuat dengan berbagai pihak, dengan berbagai aktor, sehingga kita mendapat support baik berupa pendanaan maupun support-support teknis lain yang kita perlukan di dalam upaya memastikan bahwa kontribusi masyarakat adat dalam upaya mitigasi perubahan iklim dan pelestarian keanekaragaman hayati ini betul-betul berjalan efektif. Dan pendanaan menjadi isu penting, khususnya bagi para pemimpin gerakan masyarakat adat di tingkat lokal. Saya punya pengalaman yang cukup panjang berhadapan dengan situasi di mana pendanaan yang diperoleh oleh masyarakat adat itu ya sulit ya dan banyak sekali energi yang saya harus keluarkan untuk memastikan bahwa masyarakat adat paling tidak yang ada di aliansi masyarakat adat Nusantara mendapatkan support yang cukup ya dan umumnya paling tidak selama puluhan tahun terakhir ini masyarakat adat mendapatkan dana-dana dari tingkat global itu lewat intermediary. Nah, dalam situasi seperti itu tentu saja kita ingin memastikan ke depan bahwa masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal ini mendapatkan dana yang cukup ya dan pengalaman saya puluhan tahun yang lalu mestinya tidak lagi dialami oleh para pemimpin gerakan masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal di masa depan. Itu harapan saya. Ya. Kita tentu harus membangun satu kemitraan yang baru untuk menghadapi situasi yang, yang mestinya di masa depan bisa lebih mudah bagi masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal mengakses dana-dana di tingkat global. Jadi ini yang menurut saya sangat penting. Dan yang kedua adalah ya, dana yang semakin besar tentu saja harus lebih besar kontrol masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal di dalam pengelolaannya. Dan kita tahu bahwa masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal ini ya, melalui berbagai organisasinya ya, juga bekerja untuk mendorong satu eh, satu pendanaan yang didedikasikan secara khusus kepada masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal ini dan tentu saja Pertanyaan-pertanyaan ini, tantangan-tantangan ini harus kita hadapi sama-sama. Nah, saya melihat bahwa kehadiran uh, Tenur Facility yang diinisiasi oleh uh, Right and Resource Initiative beberapa tahun lalu ini adalah untuk merespon aspirasi masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal ini. Ya. Tenur Facility dirancang sebagai institusi pendanaan global untuk mendukung secara langsung kebutuhan masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal untuk memperjuangkan kepastian hukum atas hak-haknya atas tanah dan memperkuat pengelolaan sumber daya di wilayah adatnya atau di wilayah kelolanya masing-masing. Ya. Sehingga mereka bisa membangun atau mengembangkan model-model kehidupan bersama ya, yang berkelanjutan. Nah, Kemitraan Tenur Facility dirancang sejak awal supaya bisa langsung dengan organisasi-organisasi masyarakat adat dan organisasi-organisasi komunitas lokal. Dan ini menjadi capaian penting yang dianggap oleh Tenur Facility 
ya dan mendapatkan prioritas. Nah, kondisi ideal ini tentu saja tidak selalu kita temui di, di, di banyak tempat. Karena itu, uh, Tenur Facility juga membuka peluang kemitraan dengan uh, NGO, organisasi non-pemerintah. Tapi dengan syarat organisasi non-pemerintah itu haruslah yang dipilih karena kepercayaan dari masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal. Ya, karena mereka lah penerima manfaat utama dari proyek yang didukung oleh Tenur Facility itu. Nah, kemitraan Tenur Facility dengan uh, NGO ini kita harapkan menjadi bagian dari upaya peningkatan kapasitas dan kapabilitas uh, masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal untuk nantinya bisa menjadi mitra Tenur Facility di periode berikutnya. Jadi, uh, uh, sahabat masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal semua itulah yang kita bayangkan kemitraan yang bisa mendorong dana yang akan masuk ke masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal itu ya dikendalikan dikelola oleh masyarakat adat lewat organisasi-organisasi yang dibentuknya untuk tujuan itu nah Dari pengalaman saya selama ini, saya merasakan bahwa ini bukanlah satu ide ini, ide-ide yang yang ideal ini, bukanlah sesuatu yang mudah untuk dilaksanakan. Karena itu, kalau kita mau mengurangi praktek intermediari ini, maka memang ke depan lewat tenur facility, masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal juga harus meningkatkan kapasitasnya dalam pengelolaan sumber daya yang yang kita dapatkan ya. Jadi ada upaya yang lebih serius dari organisasi-organisasi masyarakat adat dan organisasi komunitas lokal untuk menguatkan dirinya mengelola secara langsung pendanaan yang kita dapatkan dari luar. Nah, Menurut saya ini butuh perjuangan dan kita harus belajar terus menerus dari pengalaman kita selama ini termasuk dari pengalaman kita yang kita bagikan selama tiga hari di learning event ini ya yang sedang berlangsung saat ini dan dari pembelajaran ini kita akan memperbaiki uh, tenur facility sebagai uh, mekanisme pendanaan bagi masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal agar semakin efektif ya sebagai uh, untuk melaksanakan uh, uh, misinya di masa yang akan datang dan harapan saya dengan uh, tiga hari kita berbagi uh, pengalaman dengan mitra-mitra kita bisa terus menerus memberikan masukan ke tenur fasiliti hal-hal apa yang bisa di diperbaiki, dikembangkan di masa yang akan datang. Ya. Saya mengharapkan bahwa interaksi antara mitra tenur facility dengan uh, para pelaksana tenur facility di Stockholm bisa berlangsung sangat uh, baik, ya. karena hanya dengan cara itu kita bisa terus belajar sama-sama dan memperbaiki uh, tenur facility di masa yang akan datang. Mudah-mudahan apa yang saya sampaikan ini bisa me, me, memberikan kita satu upaya bersama supaya masyarakat adat dan komunitas lokal memiliki kendali yang semakin tahun, semakin besar terhadap dana-dana yang kita terima lewat Tenur Facility. Terima kasih, Fred. Itu, itu dulu dari saya. Thank you, Abdon. Uh, that was excellent, most useful. Um, our theme today is on securing women's collective land rights. <clears throat> so next, we have a keynote on that from Solange Bandiaki Baji, uh, who is the director for Africa and in charge of the Gender Justice Program at the Rights and Resources Initiative in Washington. 
um, which Abdon was talking about just a moment ago. So Solange, you have 15 minutes. Uh, please go ahead. Good morning. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fred. And um, greetings to everyone. So Fred, it's good to see you again, but I have to um, remind everyone that right now I work for an organization called uh, Partners Global and based in Washington, DC, and it's an international uh, NGO working on uh, conflict transformation, democratic institution, and sustainable development. So I've been with Partners Global for uh, two years. And if you, for those of you who don't know, uh, I have worked for the Right and Resources Initiative, RRI, for a decade. So I pretty much know many people here uh, who are part of the tenure facility uh, project. And I worked with many, mainly in Africa, and I interacted with many actors in uh, Asia and in uh, Latin America. So I want to really uh, thank the tenure facility for the invitation. And I'm very uh, happy to talk to you today about, let me see here. So about the options uh, for securing women's community land rights. And like I said, if I'm able today to really talk about this issue, it's thanks to my tenure at RRI for almost a decade. So I'm really grateful to be here and thank you again for the tenure facility. So today I want to really focus on the options because I believe there are many options, but to say that also that these options are not the one and only, it's just a way to spark the conversation. And I believe that it's important also to start documenting, showcasing and advocating for the need to secure women's community land rights. So today what I wanted to do um, with my presentation is to highlight some key concepts, talk about the context within which we are when we talk about women's uh, community land rights, share some of the few gaps that we're seeing and talk about some of the options that I'm uh, thinking about. And also for the tenure facility, what are the ways forward when we talk about securing women's uh, uh, community land rights? Today, so when, I, when you hear me really talking about communities or local communities here, I'm referring to indigenous communities, peasant communities, racial and ethnic minority communities, forest communities, pastoral communities, and all the marginalized communities that have long lived on and worked and steward the land. So it's all about community land. But also when I talk about women, First, we all need to agree that we're not treating women as a homogeneous category, but instead we are really recognizing that all women are not the same. They are all embedded in different, often multiple intersecting communities. And as I just mentioned, they all like, you know, from different background, but also from the local, from national and regional context. So here, when you hear me talk about women, I'm referring to indigenous women, local, peasant, Afro-descendant, and rural women. What is the context that we are really living in? And here, I really wanted to mention the international instruments that are really shaping how um, people are referring uh, to uh, women's land rights. We have the SDGs, we have the Paris Agreement, and we have the voluntary guidelines. And the SDGs address women's right to land and natural resources directly, but also the Paris Agreement recognize the equal rights of women and men, but also acknowledging the difference between men and women, but also taking a, talking about the need for specific measures that are aimed to accelerating de facto equality when uh, necessary. We also have national policies that relate to gender equality. And I think many of the countries that are part of the Tenure Faculty Project are referring to those national policies uh, and justifying why they're having this um, a project to implement those policies. And mainly the national uh, laws and policies on forest and land. And most of the Tenure Faculty Projects, it's all about implementing those uh, national policies 
that recognize the right of indigenous people, of um, women, and uh, within like, you know, the communities. So what are the key gaps that we see? While all these instruments that I mentioned, like the international instrument and the national pol uh, policies are a step, positive step, creating also a space uh, for change, implementation does not often match the intent. So that while there has been progress, there is still a long way to go when it comes to gender equality. But also if you look at the mainstream feminist theorizing around uh, women's land rights, they focus mainly on agriculture. They talk about like women as individual and they have this macroeconomic uh, um, view about, uh, about that. Then that to me, when, you, when they do that, they're really missing some other part. Like we talk about people, community from the, from the forest, indigenous people, but also the fact that there are other types of approach, the collective of uh, women and also the community as a collective where men and women, they belong to the same community and fight for their, for their rights. And even as women increasingly bear the responsibility of community land and forest management, they remain disproportionately constrained by unjust laws and practices, whether legal, legal or uh, customary. But studies also have shown like, you know, women's lack of opportunity to participate in land governance and little participation in land formalization. So these are some key questions uh, that I want to share today. How do you go about narrowing the gap in securing women's community land rights? What do we know about securing women's community land right? And what are the existing options? And today I would like to share five op options. And like I said at the beginning, these are not the only options, but studies have really talked about this type of option and it would be good for the tenure facility to start really thinking about it. And I'm sure most of it has already started to be implemented with uh, the tenure facility project. But I'll go through each of these options and I'll share my view on that. The first option is what the Rights and Resources Initiative, like I've been saying for quite a while, is that securing community land rights and the legal advancement of women go hand in hand. For those of you who have not had a chance to read uh, that major publication from uh, RRI, I think two to three years ago, called Power and Potential that really looked into how national laws and regulations have talked about like, you know, um, forest tenure rights uh, to indigenous people and uh, rural women. So what the major findings are that, you know, securing community land rights and the legal advancement of women goes hand in hand. Women are disproportionately affected when land rights are not respected. So here, and I think that's what most of the tenure facility projects are doing. They're trying to secure community land rights, be it indigenous, Afro-descendant, rural, or peasant. But at the same time, they're trying to really secure the rights of the women. But how do you do it in practice? So my question to most of the tenure facility implementers is that in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, how do you do that in practice? How do you defend the rights or secure the rights of the community and at the same time, secure the rights of uh, women within that community to not create conflict, but just make sure that there is harmony, but also make sure the rights of women are uh, recognized and secured. And the second option, which is really linked to the first option, is that securing the collective land rights of women contribute to their economic development of the community, of their family, and increase women's decision-making power. And here, the reason why I'm grading this option is that while you secure the right of um, local communities of indigenous uh, people, of Afro-descendant, rural and peasant women, in order to really focus on the gender aspect or in order to focus on securing women's land right, we need gender disaggregated indicators or data. So it's about beyond going beyond the numbers and I know one of the main aspects and not the only of many of the project is the number of hectares that have been secured for the communities. But if you just focus on the number of hectares, you'll be missing a lot on the other factors. 
So here, it's very important when you do that, when you secure the uh, community land right to look into women, you need to look to have to use gender as an analytical tool. So when I say gender he is, he is, uh, here is that you need to look into issues related to inclusion, justice, social, economic, cultural norms, but also the power dynamic between men and women. But go also beyond that dichotomy of men and women, but also look into the power relation within the local structures and institutions. And uh, like I said at the first option, RRI have developed some indicators that are and a great framework that can be applied to community land. But I also believe that the tenure facility has um, some indicators that they have developed to see how to look into women's land rights or how to secure within women's land rights within the communities. And an important aspect also when you work within the communities is to have men as allies. Because again, while securing the right of the community and when you wanna secure the right of um, women, you just don't wanna create conflict. So how do you bring men to really accept, understand like the need for women's land right to be secure? The third option is access to land institution, how women like indigenous women and all the marginalized voices would have to participate in the design of land tenure uh, regime. So that's really also an important um, aspect to really uh, keep in mind. And here, one factor uh, which may uh, really matter is access to land uh, institution. And if women have no access to land institution, be they local or national, formal or informal, then it makes it very, a, very, a very little difference what kind of system of land tenure is in place. And following the longstanding principle in the social justice movement, they say no decisions about us without us. It has been long recognized that for effectiveness and justice, people need to be included in the design and implementation of policies that affect uh, their life. And um, another question or other question for the tenure facility to think about is how are women included in decision-making processes and within the local land structures that uh, all, like, um, all the projects are really implementing? Because I know uh, many are working on like, you know, local uh, institutions but the participation of women in the decision-making process is key. But also how are women involved in the decision-making of the legalization process of indigenous territories? These are key questions uh, to really uh, think about. And option four is women have organized collectively to promote women's land rights in policy and legal framework and implementation. And here I want to uh, raise two um, uh, case studies that I uh, know about. One is Burkina Faso, and I'm sure they are um, uh, part of this audience. So Ten Forest has been working for uh, like, you know, many years now uh, with RRI before. And right now, I think that they've already developed a concept or uh, a proposal for the tenure facility. So Ten Forest has been working on securing women's collective land rights. So it's a very focused, uh, gender focused project that the tenure facility will have to really learn from. And I think here, what really matter is how they work with women's group, women's network at the local level to help them get local land certificate that have been recognized within the 2009 uh, land law in Burkina Faso. Another example in the DRC, and I think that uh, some might know about, but uh, I think it would be good for the tenure facility to look into, there is an, um, a women's network based in the DRC called CEFLED. And CEFLED have been really working at the provincial level to secure the land rights of uh, peasant and indigenous women. And they have what they call this um, local land certificate. And in French, it's called the EDI. So they have so far over the last five years developed like six uh, local land certificate and what they do, they go into at the provincial level, they have this multi-stakeholder dialogue with uh, customer chief, uh, local administrator, but also they help women map their land, the, one, the land that has been uh, customarily uh, recognized, but also the land that women have bought. 
and see how they can really help them map that and secure those land. So these are just few, uh, two examples, but I'm sure if we look into all the African countries, if we look into Asia and Latin America, they might be all the example that we should be looking at or the tenure facility should be looking at and start documenting. So there are many options out there, but it's just that how do you know about it and how do you go about really gathering the information? And also how can the tenure facility tap into these existing women's group? Have they worked with like, you know, women's led organization? That's something because they have a long history of uh, working and uh, securing uh, women's community land, right? So it will be good to really see what are the other options out there and how to start document and showcase. And the last option and not the least, like I said, there are so many out there, but this is just for the sake of this presentation that I wanted to really bring up these important uh, aspects. And the five option is that securing women's community land rights contribute to women's resiliency to conflict and in post-conflict uh, settings. Like I said, over the last two years, I've been working at Partners Global and one of our focus is like, you know, peace building and security uh, sector reform. And one, what I've really seen is that natural resource conflict, mainly land dispute are really shaping the, the, the type of conflict that we are seeing in many countries and within the local communities. So it will be really important to really pay attention to uh, peace building conflict resolutions while securing uh, women's uh, community land rights. And um, how do, to address women and community land rights in post war uh, setting? What are the challenges in implementing those reforms? And uh, what we have seen is that in many peace uh, building processes, women's right to land are sometimes made part of these uh, peace building processes. But also in post-war settings, I mean, there's so many um, challenges related to land because there's ongoing dispossession, but also there are people who become landless and people are, we have these internally displaced people. And all of that is really changing the tenure dynamic within uh, some of the communities. And I think uh, if you take, for example, the case of Liberia, the land reform process has been part of the peace building process starting in 2006. And also right now, what we are seeing, for example, in Mali and in Burkina Faso and most of the Sahelian region in West Africa, where there's conflict really going on, it's important for the tenure facility project that are being implemented right now to really keep an eye on how all these ongoing conflicts linked to violent extremism is really redesigning the land tenure system within the communities, because in one way or another, it will really have impact on what the tenure facility is uh, kind of implementing uh, at this point. We have seen also the, uh, this um, farmer header conflict in, in Africa going on a lot where you know, the right of um, uh, pastoralist communities who are really indigenous, but people are not really talking about those type of rights, where the pastoralists, they're not static, but they are mobile uh, communities. But how do you recognize, for example, the right of those type of communities to really avoid conflict between farmer and, and, and herder? So I think really for the tenure facility, uh, it is really important to really also start looking into conflict uh, settings, post-war settings, and see what does it mean to secure community land right? What does it mean to secure indigenous uh, people's right and women's uh, community land right within those type of um, uh, contexts? And I'm sure, like I said, there are many other options, but I just wanted to share these five options. And last, well, I, as I was really working on this presentation and I was wondering, is there really a gender strategy for the tenure facility? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but I think there's a need for the tenure facility to have a clear gender strategy and really define, for example, for this existing project right now, how do we mainstream gender within the uh, existing project? How do we develop indicators, gender desegregated indicators that can be applied to the project that are being implemented? And also start documenting case studies uh, of, um, to secure women's community land, right? I talked about the DRC, I talked about Burkina Faso, but I'm sure 
in Asia, in, in Latin America, there are some um, uh, options or case studies that uh, we should really learn from and, and draw some uh, lessons. And also last, it would be good for the tenure facility to identify some of the women's led organization or the key women's network and NGOs that work on securing women's community land rights and start really seeing what kind of partnership can, uh, can be done. Also, how do we learn from those women? And there are so many women organizing as a collective in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. So it would be really good for the tenure facility to really think uh, broadly about gender and have a very comprehensive approach, but not just have an uh, ad hoc approach. So this is really what I wanted to share today, and I thank you all for your kind uh, attention. And again, thank you for the tenure facility um, for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Solange. Um, that's a really challenging agenda, um, and I'm, I'm sorry to have been out of date with your career, but uh, I'll try and keep up in future. Um, now we turn to India. Um, where for the past decade communities have been trying to gain the rights to their local forests that in theory were accorded to them under the 2008 Forest Rights Act. Um, before we talk about that and other things with our speakers, here is our first five minute film of the day. Morning has broken deep inside a con village. Life here revolves around the weekly market. 30 to 40 tribal hamlets buy and sell goods and items here. But since the start of the coronavirus, the weekly markets have only been held on every alternate weekend. This COVID-19 has very badly affected life and livelihood of our people here in Con. I am working here since last four decades, but I have never seen such a situation in the The pandemic here had an enormous impact on the livelihoods of the local people, but it also impacted the progress of the land rights project and the work of the Tenure Facilities Partners, the Indian School of Business, Vasundara, and their sub-partner, Antaranga, the Society for Rural, Urban, and Tribal Initiative, Mantan Yuva Samstan, and Parivatan. Our volunteers and facilitators, uh, they did not able to move around the villages. Uh, secondly, they have an issue uh, letters to the respective uh, community-based organization in order to conduct the meetings uh, in the villages. Everywhere uh, you will find the police, uh, people and the government officials watching and guiding, guiding the people. The Tenure Facilities Partners have spent two years building up relationships with the local people in order to not let this valuable network sit idle during the period of lockdown they shifted their focus. The facilitators and volunteers have organized awareness drives in 1,200 different villages, where their network has been actively helping the district administration in this collective effort to stave off the danger of the coronavirus. But they didn't stop there. <laughs> Uh, 
All of the work the tenure facilities partners have done during lockdown has been valuable but they never forgot their focus on making land claims. As lockdown began to lift, they focused their energy once again on the primary goal. Basically, after having a long discussion and uh, persuasion with the district administration regarding STLC meeting, the chairman from Subcollector STLC has decided to conduct STLC meeting on 23rd September 2020 with the other guideline of COVID-19, or STLC has recommended 358 safer claims to DLC on the day. I would like to say that a beautiful and sustainable relationship has been built between the people and the PRA institutions, bringing the people and institutions in one table. Um, we have two speakers from India today. We'll hear from Shweta Trifati, Director of the Society for Rural, Urban and Tribal Initiatives, and from Giri Rao, Director of Vasundara, which is an NGO working on natural resources uh, governance in the state of Odisha. Um, now, I have three brief questions that I hope the two of you can share between you. I'll let you divide them up. First, can you say more about how badly the pandemic is affecting forest dependent communities in India, perhaps based on recent experience of the last few weeks? Second, the film talks about doing surveys, raising awareness, excuse me, in more than a thousand villages. Um, I wonder how you achieve this uh, and how that relationship works with the communities. And third, I wonder if you can give a gender perspective on this um, in line with our theme today. Are women at the forefront of what's going on here? So first, um, perhaps uh, Shweta can address some of those questions. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you, Fred. Greetings to everyone from India. While we're having the learning exchange, the COVID-19 positive cases in India have reportedly touched 9 million with death toll crossing 128,000. The pandemic has had a drastic effect on a large population of poor and marginalized communities. There was exodus of nearly 40 million interstate migrant workers, including the tribals and other forest dwelling communities from the cities to rural pockets following the announcement of the first phase of lockdown. The tribal migrant workers got stuck in the cities without any support system, facing acute hunger and almost a famine-like situation. The pandemic exposed many of the lacuna in the implementation of welfare schemes and services. Absence of healthcare facilities in tribal areas with prevalence of diseases and health concerns severely limited the capacities to deal with any major COVID-19 outbreak, posing a serious threat to tribal population. There are various reports of starvation from the tribal areas since they remain excluded from most of the socio-economic schemes or benefits. Under these circumstances, the two laws in India, Forest Rights Act, passed in the year 2006, providing customary individual and collective rights of forest dwellers, and another law known as PESA, passed in 1996, to ensure self-governance through traditional village assemblies have helped facilitating support to the tribals and forest dwellers at various levels in the time of pandemic. Amidst the news of interstate migration, there was generation of additional 50 days work for the title holders under the Forest Rights Act 
to Employment Guarantee Scheme in India, registering over 16,000 new names benefiting 4.58% title holders. The collection, use, and sale of minor forests produced by tribals and forest dwellers too got severely affected due to the pandemic. The collection season this year coincided with the lockdown that has adversely impacted the livelihoods from the minor forest produce, especially those of women forest dwellers who are most actively engaged in collection and sale. Amid such hardships faced by the communities, the dilution of laws and policies to boost the economy has furthered the resentment among the local communities. There has already been forest diversion of around 0.39 million hectare of forest land in last 10 years in India. Recent announcements on much dilution of environment law, liberalization in entry norms for private entities in coal sector has furthered the ground disappointments and anger as it would cause destruction of the ancestral forests, displacement and loss of livelihoods. After a decade and a half since the Forest Rights Act was passed, only 13% of the overall potential of forest rights has been demarcated so far. The tenure facility, the tenure security project in India could help filing claims for over 800,000 hectares of land, securing about 250,000 hectares of land across 5,600 villages over two years under the Forest Rights Act. Even in the times of pandemic, as we've also watched in the film, the communities could secure land rights of over 100,000 hectares across the states. That brings the stories of hope from various pockets of the country. We empowered village assemblies under the Forest Rights Act initiated a holistic COVID-19 governance plan well before local administration. It also gives example of how secured tenure and empowered village assemblies can help reduce distress migration even in the crisis times of pandemic. To give some examples, around 50 villages assemblies organized as a federation in central India earned $340,000 by selling minor forest produce while taking precautions against the spread of COVID-19. Women have also played a key role in managing the crisis in areas where the village assemblies were empowered. In many areas, women organized system of food distribution, water collection, and even made face masks of leaves to ensure safety in the time of pandemic. Such is the spirit of collaborating efforts during the tough times thanks to our grassroots leaders. Walking hand in hand with the belief of overcoming such tough times, stories of collective faith, struggle, hope, solidarity has been keeping us at India and I think at, across the world as well, motivated and inspired to continue with our struggle for equity, peace and justice. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Shruta. Um, I'm going to move on now to uh, Giri Rao. Maybe you can pick up on some of the aspects, particularly of the surveys and raising awareness of a thousand villages. Um, but uh, Giri, please, please, it's over to you. Thank you. Fred and also because one of my colleagues, Sweta, has made easier, I can uh, put forth. Uh, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So the, the Sweta has made the highlighted the stories of the India how the uh, in our country the things are moving. But I am bringing a very small story where how the local communities has able to address such type of uh, issues during the pandemic situation. Uh, before I'm starting the story, I can tell you we are, now where are we are working, that is, a, that is located in co east coast of the India with a population of 43 million, and of which the population, 22% population constitutes the indigenous and two third of the indigenous population are living the below in the poverty line and more than that 50 percent territories are considered as a state property in such situation if we look around the the districts where we are working one of the districts in the kandamal where there are the 87 percent belong uh, land belongs to the state so in such situation when the pandemic has uh, started so at that time, we, what we decided how to address such type of issues. So first time, what we have decided collectively, the three, uh, we, we put forth as three objective on ourselves. One is the 
the how to stop the community spreading of the uh, this uh, covid 19 and also no family should go hunger and restoration of the livelihood in such a situation we have developed four strategies one strategy is the sensitization and mobilization of the youths particularly in the traditional leaders extended support to the frontline government staffs and the local bodies and convergence of various programs and entitlement declared by the state and the central government and highlighting the stories particularly the problems faced by the women from the grassroots through the social media and other the print and the visual media in the in such a context if we look into the one of the areas the largest youth club which has been seen in the picture the antaranga antaranga is a confrontation of a of a local youth club uh, which covers around the around the 13240 members from the 1013 villages this club came into the existence in the 2008 when the communal rights took place in the kandamal district where 39 people died and more than 54000 houses were destroyed initially period this club was focused more more on the peace building in that area over the time they have realized that the access and control is the root cause for all the type of problems in their in their own territory and they got involved with us from the 2018 and focusing on the recognition of the community for a strike and during the lockdown they joined their hand with the district administration and the local administration to minimize the impact of the covid 19 in their own area the key members who are trained by the local administration and this team reached around the 100 1023 villages by their members and created awareness on the COVID-19 and distributed masks and also helped the particularly the women how to wear the mask and they have met a lot of effort at the community level which was quite difficult at that situation and extended their support to the each families due to their constant effort around the 43,881 households availed all the government programs and schemes declared by the state and central government. And they have also extended the marketing of the support of the forest products to the 12,765 families, where these families earned around the 259,000 USD. Similarly, they have also helped 33,874 families in obtaining employment under the Rural Employment Guarantee Program, which my colleague uh, Sweta has highlighted. And these families are able to earn around the 280,000 uh, uh, 280, uh, USD through this uh, Rural Employment Guarantee Program. And this initiative not only helped the local communities, but also the district administration in normalizing the situation. Once the situation normalized, they started focusing on claim facilitation. And surprisingly, due to this all the effort, they got overwhelming support from the local communities. And within the last three months, they have been able to submit 470 claims at the SDHC level, of which 451 claims already been approved by the uh, subdivisional level committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Giddy. In fact, thank, thank you both. Um, fascinating stories from India. Um, now we move on over the border into Nepal, which in the past three decades has made huge strides in developing community forests. And here is our video on that. After a decade of political upheaval, Nepal entered a phase of peace process and stability in 2006. The adoption of a new constitution in 2015 saw land reforms and tenure rights properly established in law. However, efforts to digitize land registration remain patchy, resulting in outdated or inaccurate information. The legal rights of community forest groups can be withdrawn at any time by forestry officials. The precarious situation in the communities 
was worsened by the arrival of the pandemic. COVID-19 pandemic uh, are affecting to the directly local community and indigenous peoples and women, especially community forest users group are facing the many challenges. Community groups are uh, continue regular meeting, cannot organize, assembly cannot organize. So that types of the problem are facing and directly affected to the uh, local community and indigenous people in the grassroots level. Despite the challenges, the Tenure Facilities Partners, Green Foundation Nepal, and the Center for Indigenous Peoples Research and Development Nepal, have been working to coordinate the local communities and carry on with the project however they can. We are facing to the many uh, challenges uh, and uh, not only project, uh, institutional activity also. We made a, a different project, uh, basically focused to the COVID-19 pandemic. We used to the technology like Zoom, Facebook, YouTube. We used to the, that uh, methodology to local community, to the policy maker and our institutional mobilization. Community people are organizing to the many types of the activity and awareness raising and the grassroots level. And in this time, similar, we mobilized to the all over the country more than 22,000 community forest users group. Uh, they are actively playing the role, especially support to the food and the um, uh, poor people. And during this time, the Federation of Community Forest Users Nepal, or FICOFAN, for short, have become more united than ever. We feel not only fake fun, like all government and other stakeholders also realize we are a very united uh, organization and uh, more uh, effort playing to the community groups and indigenous people. And the tenure facilities partners also have newfound strength. We are learning to the make a pre-plan for the institutionally. So most important for the uh, how can use to the community resource uh, through the community forest users group support to the youth, uh, young people and women. We are thinking to the post-COVID uh, like uh, make a plan for the FACO fund and the institutionally post-COVID plan. And similarly, we are coordinating to the province government and local government, more focused to the livelihood for the local community and local people and women's group and indigenous people. It's a fascinating story with more than 20,000 community forest user groups, many of them run by women and a lot more trees in the country. Now we have three speakers from Nepal, so I'm going to ask them to all be very short. Um, first, we have Sindhu Dugana, Dungana, who is Joint Secretary at the Ministry of Forests and the Environment. Um, the film mentioned that some communities, despite their strength, felt that some of their rights were vulnerable. So I'd be interested if you could address that. Please tell us how the ministry is engaging with community forest user groups. Um, again, time is tight. So if you can do three minutes, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, uh, actually, the Ministry of Forest and Environment in Nepal uh, is supporting community forestry uh, programs uh, through its policy transformation, legal transformation, programmatic engagement, and also some institutional transformation. Although uh, we need to do a lot in practice. So uh, in policy transformation, we have a national forest policy 2019 that was passed last year. And that is a foundation for all the legal institutional and programmatic uh, change. And the one most important thing in uh, National Forest Policy 2019 is that it has focused on sustainable management of community forest, uh, where, you know, and also we have focused uh, at least 50% women uh, to be engaged in, uh, not only in community forest, but also in all forestry sector institutions. Uh, that is uh, most important in the policy, uh, national forest policy. And also the 15th uh, periodic plan of the government for 2019 to 2024. 
uh, and it has targeted at least 40 percent of national forest uh, under community forest so currently we have 33 percent already handed over to community forest the second thing uh, the ministry has done so far is legal uh, change legal reform the forest act of 2019 and uh, the most important thing in terms of community forest uh, management uh, in in this act is uh, the all the income goes to community forest user groups and out of that uh, you know 20% of the total income has to be spent for forest management and at least 50% uh, has to be uh, you know spent in enterprise development poverty reduction and women empowerment that is very new thing in the law and uh, the, you know addressing to your questions about how we are uh, tackling uh, the uh, pandemic through community forest uh, currently is uh, recently the central government has lifted 15 percent tax on the sale of community forest products so that used to be collected by central government people it has been lifted uh, and the second one is uh, the government has uh, allocated uh, some budget to support to community-based forest enterprises as seed money so that uh, they can have some uh, matching fund and so they can um, you know promote uh, forest-based enterprises and third one is also the government has uh, dedicated allocated some budget to support community forest user groups in ecotourism activities uh, within community forest and the fourth one is support to agroforestry program so these are the new things that has been started in july 2020 uh, and uh, as a response to uh, to tackle covid uh, and uh, the fourth one uh, so the uh, we have also tried to do some institutional uh, reform uh, the government has a form, uh, government formed uh, three months ago a high level committee to recommend some uh, some changes reform in forestry sector and that has recommended uh, 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 recommended the re, uh, to reconsider the role of community forest user groups in community forest for its sustainable management so there was a very strong protest from Federation of Community Forest Users that, you know, in the name of scientific forest management, the techno bureaucratic uh, institutions uh, try to, uh, you know, recentralize the role of community forest uh, going back to the government. So that has been challenged by the report of the high level committee, and that is already endorsed by the government that the role of the community forest user groups uh, has to be reconsidered so that they can have a full control over the community forest and over the uh, forest products that are that are produced in the uh, in the forest and also they will have uh, a role how how to develop uh, forest based enterprises and all those things uh, through sustainable forest management so that way i think the ministry is uh, fully engaged with community forest user groups plus feco fund uh, but uh, I already told you that uh, there is a lot uh, to do uh, the things uh, to make the community forest user groups really a custodian, uh, custodian with the full right over the resources in future. And the ministry will be uh, collaborating with FECOFAN to do so. And also with some other, other institutions such as, you know, Federation of uh, uh, Indigenous Nationalities, the NEFIN, and separate uh, so dr pasang is going to speak uh, next and also the green foundation and local gov government as well uh, that's it thank you okay. great that's that's fantastic thank you so much um next i'm going to pass on to uh, pasang dolma sherpa director of the center for indigenous peoples research and development and i wonder if you can tell us about the challenges that women in particular face in community forests thank you uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, and good evening and good afternoon. Um, uh, great to uh, meet you. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to share 
uh, uh, the thoughts and uh, especially the women's and particularly indigenous women's uh, specific challenges um, faced uh, at the moment, uh, either in the community forestry or any kind of uh, natural resource management or governance. So I will be more focusing on the, the specific uh, uh, challenges uh, the particular the indigenous women have been facing. The one of the most uh, challenges indigenous women have been facing is because of the historically marginalization exclusions. So because of the continue uh, marginalization Marginalizations in the in the norm, in the in the uh, area of the modernization or development or any kind of techni uh, technology or uh, capitalistic uh, uh, approach, the uh, capability deprivation it has been there. So uh, it's uh, because of the uh, continued social uh, exclusion in terms of gender and uh, ethnicity. So uh, because of that one, uh, the uh, irregular or the low income of the indigenous women or women's groups and also the uh, occupations, uh, employments, culture. So there are, these are the different factors that has, uh, um, you know, become the main causes of the, uh, the uh, capability deprivation of the women's and also uh, particularly indigenous uh, women's. The second part uh, is also, uh, the, uh, the second part is, uh, you know, the uh, no legal recognition of the uh, land certificate of the women's and particularly indigenous women's. Uh, that has been a uh, continue uh, the uh, deprivation of, uh, uh, you know, the continuation of the traditional uh, practices and their uh, cultural and their spiritual values to the natural resources and continuation of their traditional knowledge and their, and their livelihoods uh, initiatives. So that has uh, causes, uh, 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 one of the main causes of the uh, poverty uh, for them, and that has been on another causes of the migration, and especially seeking the foreign employments and uh, either the city or the foreign countries. And because most of the men's and most of the youth, uh, they have migrated to the, the city or uh, foreign employment abroad, that has created a really low uh, workload pressure uh, to the women's uh, because they have uh, now the uh, doubles and triples of the workload, not only for the raising the children, but also household, social work, and also uh, responsibility for different uh, social uh, initiatives or other uh, responsibility. Then another another part is also uh, you know the uh, the uh, pat uh, patriarchy and also uh, the. Uh, uh, the patriarchy and the continuation of the social inclusion. So these are the different part and, and, and one of the, and because of this one, the uh, level of the awareness level and capacity of the women's are very low and their access to the resources and then access uh, and advocacy is also very low because of their cap low capability. So uh, I, I, I really believe that uh, this tier of projects has been opportunity for women and also for indigenous women's and also indigenous peoples, uh, especially for uh, different levels. The first level is a. Uh, this is a. Uh, uh, this is a opportunity for us to proof uh, with the evidence uh, through our documentation and mapping, and also collected the disaggregated data to help that how indigenous peoples, how women, how indigenous women have been contributing for the uh, sustainable management of the natural resources, continuation of their livelihoods, even dealing with the pandemic, um, and to show the show the uh, policy makers or the uh, the uh, stakeholder stakeholders for the important role they have been playing for the uh, adaptation and mitigation to the impacts of climate change. The another part with this TR project, we are really hope for the awareness raising and capacity building of women and, and also from the intersectionality approach that would deal with the also different levels of the and different uh, you know backgrounds of indigenous peoples or women in general that has uh, Soles has mentioned that uh, also uh, in her presentation. The, th the third part is like a continuation how we can uh, empower and uh, uh, you know enhance the traditional livelihoods and also through the income generation activities by empowering more social entrepreneurs so that they can uh, they, they can continue their they can protect their skills knowledge system and also the cultural practices uh, and the pass to the future generation based on the different uh, layers of the pro, uh, the trainings they uh, finally uh, this uh, and finally the tier projects would help 
to uh, for the uh, advocacy and, and uh, advocacy uh, initiatives, especially policy advocacy, uh, uh, because we have with the help of the documentation and the mapping and the evidence that we have uh, provided, so that uh, the uh, the policy advocacy to the stakeholders and the government agencies will finally help to include the women's collective land drives. Thank you very much, Fred. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm sorry to press you for time, but, but we are short. Um, okay, can we move on to uh, Gansham Pandey, Chair of the Green Foundation in Nepal? Um, I know you work specifically on skills development, so please tell us what you have achieved. Yes, please go ahead. Um, unmute yourself if you need to. Mr. Ganjan, your audio seems to be um, off. Please try to disconnect your headphones, your earphones, sorry. Uh, oh dear, I think we might have to move on. I don't think we have a solution to that problem. I think we probably had better move on. Um, my apologies for that. Um, we're going to move on to... Uh, Are you hearing me? Hello? Fred? Yes. Are you hearing me? Uh, is that Gansham? Yes, please. He's back. Yes. Uh, Are you back. hearing me? Please go ahead. Hello? Yes, so we Are can you hear you. Please go ahead now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, good, uh, good evening from Nepal and good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you, uh, TF uh, team for uh, inviting me to this Nepal session. And also, I think you have uh, got a lot of idea from the presentation video, as well as the presentation uh, uh, from the uh, Pasang and Dr. Sindhu. I completely agree with uh, the previous uh, presenters' ideas uh, that uh, Nepal uh, is a pioneer in community forestry. And uh, even this uh, uh, pandemic situation of COVID, uh, the community forestry just grows together with uh, federal government, provincial government, and local government are uh, doing as a local champion in terms of the uh, awareness raising uh, to the local communities, as well as also provided in the uh, safety materials, such as uh, uh, these sanitizers, masks, food, and other things. So at the FECO fund had a, uh, a good decision in the timely, and the loss of the lo local community forest users building are uh, uh, allocated for the quarantine as well. So uh, because of this uh, community forest users group, uh, which are spread all over the country, and they have uh, uh, provided all this support to the uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to deal the, uh, the current COVID situation. But in terms of the new uh, enterprise and other things, what uh, I just Sindhu said that the government has already uh, put uh, some money for the forest enterprises and also uh, community forest users group has also uh, willing to do the community forest enterprises. And this is very important the current time. In Nepal, there may be the more than uh, 1 million uh, migrant worker return back uh, to the Nepal from India and abroad, and they have lost their jobs, and they have, uh, have a critical situation because of the pandemic situation. In this situation, uh, Green Foundation Nepal, Supret, um, Peko Fund together, uh, we are having uh, 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 supporting to the local government and uh, community forest users group to develop the COVID response plan so that that COVID response plan, not only providing the healthy health materials and safety 
measure to the local community, but also to provide the livelihood of some uh, self uh, income generating activity and also uh, helping them to create the local community first enterprises so that uh, they will get the uh, some kind of the local employment in the community levels and uh, through our this general facility program uh, we are planning to work with the local government and with the uh, lo local community first users group uh, to develop the community based forest enterprises based on the Nepal forest policy, as uh, Dr. Sindhu said that we have a good uh, national forest policy as well as the uh, policy uh, instrument that has done through the uh, federal government, uh, provincial government and local government. And uh, these are uh, going to help to establish the community forest enterprise at the local level and these enterprise may help the uh, local people uh, to uh, create the jobs at the local level. So that the, the current problem that we are facing. Thank you. I'm, uh, going, to, I'm going to have to ask you to call a halt. We, we, no, we're running behind time. Thank you very much. Because of the COVID, they will get the livelihood option at the uh, community level. I think these are the activities uh, together, federal government, provincial and local government with the local community forest users group and the FECO fund and other partners also, uh, we are planning to work together. I think I, I uh, will stop here. And if you need to uh, have some question, then I will come back again. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you very much. I hope we'll maybe hear from you again in the panel session. Thank you. We're going to move on from um, Nepal now. Um, let me first remind you that if you have any questions for our speakers so far, please submit them via the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen so I can put them to the panel later. Now we move to Africa and to Mozambique, which has been praised recently for having some of the best land tenure and community conservation policies on the continent. Um, so the question, I guess, is whether they work on the ground. So here is our video to address issues in Mozambique. Land tenure has always been a source of friction in Mozambique. At times, it has fueled bitter conflict. But recently, it has seen Mozambique develop some of the best policies and legal frameworks for land tenure on the African continent. Nevertheless, most rural farmers are unable to obtain documentation that proves the existence of their land rights, which is significant in a country where agriculture constitutes around a quarter of GDP. The socio-economic impacts of the pandemic have been severe, with restricted movement between rural and urban areas fueling a collapse in demand for agricultural products. This is the same thing, you can't go to one place, but it means that many things are left in place. Before there was no disease, the majority of the buyers came from the exterior, they came from the other side, others came from the other side. When the tenure facility and its partners, Oram Nampula, Terra Firma, Lupa and Nitidai, began work in July 2019, no one could have imagined that instead of mapping, demarcation, and capacity building, our partners would find themselves at the forefront of the local coronavirus response. The government of Mozambique decreed a state of emergency, and now the government is obliged to interrupt the activities of the camp during the period of three to four months that vigorou the state of emergency. Despite being unable to visit the communities, Tenure Facilities partners nevertheless swung into action. Agora, a todo medida de prevenção levou a cabo uma série de atividades com vista 
para minimizar a situação da, da pandemia. Estas medidas conjuntas com o governo uh, consistiram basicamente na aquisição de alguns, uh, de alguns kits, por exemplo, de prevenção com máscaras, uh, produção de spots, aquisição de megafones, as reuniões de, de treinamento dos líderes comunitários sobre a Covid. Portanto, pensamos que produziu resultados desejados, porque a partir daí as comunidades passaram a saber muito mais do que era necessário fazer para se prevenir da contaminação da Covid. Despite there being few, if any, reported cases of COVID-19 in the communities where our partners are working, everyone recognizes the importance of finding ways to work in a world that has altered and may remain altered for a long time to come. Como prioridade em termos de saúde, em termos de prepararmos o terreno para a retoma, tínhamos que aplicar esse dinheiro nessa atividade de pandemia. Ações que não estavam previstas no plano do projeto, tanto no plano orçamentário do projeto. Então, há muita coisa que vai mudar, obviamente, mas nós estamos conscientes disso e esperamos que no final deste ano, não é? de 2020, vamos ter uma indicação clara de quanto é que estamos a, a, a realizar, quanto é que teremos gasto e o que é que deve ser necessário para ajustar neste processo. Okay, excellent. Um, we have just one speaker from Mozambique today, and that is uh, Calisto uh, Ribeiro, who is the regional delegate of ORAM, the organization mentioned in the film. That's the Rural Association for Mutual Support in Mozambique. Uh, so welcome, Calisto. Um, can I ask you, the video mentions how communities have been hit by the pandemic and talks about their responses. I wonder if you could tell us more, especially, I hope, about, about the role of women in this. So uh, please go ahead, Calisto. Good tarde. Vou falar em português uh, para a nossa audiência também em português. Um, agradeço imenso. Boa tarde, bom dia e boa noite para todo mundo. Um, as respostas mais importantes um, é, para a Covid foram a rápida adoção das medidas de prevenção da Covid, principalmente para as mulheres ao lado dos homens e ao nível das comunidades. Muito rapidamente as populações rurais, é, mulheres e homens, acataram as medidas anunciadas pelo governo e, portanto, nós acreditamos que o projeto contribuiu para a disseminação destas medidas junto das autoridades locais. As mulheres, em particular, não perderam o entusiasmo de continuar as suas vidas. Elas continuaram a aderir, a aderir às atividades do, do projeto. Ah, é, portanto, ficaram afincadamente envolvidas nas atividades de sensibilização sobre os seus direitos, sobre a importância de elas se integrarem nas associações comunitárias que são responsáveis pela gestão das terras assim como também ficaram muito envolvidas na delimitação das suas parcelas, onde elas produzem para o sustento das suas famílias, obedecendo todas as medidas de prevenção contra a Covid. Portanto, as pessoas, particularmente as mulheres, continuam de forma surpreendente engajadas em desenvolver atividades para o seu crescimento e bem-estar. Alisto, would you mind to bring your camera down a little? Thank you. Ah, sorry. Okay, yeah. Better now. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah. Um, creio que existe outra questão, pois não? All good now. Please continue. Yeah. Okay. Um, e nisto tudo, portanto, portanto, um, our, yes. Calisto, please carry on, please carry okay, on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Nisto tudo, portanto, um, o, o, como, como dizia o, 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 o Fred, Moçambique um, tem uma das melhores leis de terra de África. Entretanto, um, 
a, a lei nem sempre vai bem. Uh, tivemos, que, tivemos que fazer uma grande análise desde que ela foi introduzida, de, desde de finais de, do, do, dos anos 90. Então, vimos que havia muita coisa que não estava bem. Nós entendemos que as populações rurais uh, entendem que a terra é o seu principal recurso para a sua existência. A legislação moçambicana defende também que as comunidades locais têm o direito de gerir de forma sustentável as suas terras e recursos naturais, recursos florestais, recursos minerais, recursos marinhos, entre outros. Também a legislação estabelece que as comunidades locais têm o direito de formalizar as suas terras e registrar no cadastro natural. Entretanto, as dificuldades de acessibilidade ao sistema formal de cadastro natural, os custos e os problemas de circulação de suas terras têm tornado muito difícil para as comunidades fazerem uma gestão sustentável das suas terras de recursos naturais. No outro lado, as comunidades também têm recebido grandes investimentos Uh, para a exploração de recursos naturais na área mineira, na área florestal. E a lei permite que as comunidades estabeleçam parcerias com estes investidores. Então, a Orami, Fronter, desculpa, a Orami Terra Firma e Nitidae, Nitidae, julgaram que era uh, que para assegurar uma gestão sustentável de recursos naturais, para criar um ambiente favorável de parcerias entre comunidades locais, governo e investidores externos, o setor privado, é preciso criar capacidade local. Nós entendíamos que não era possível por três ou quatro interessados a dialogarem sobre assuntos quando um dos participantes não conhece o que é que, por que é que está lá. Estamos a falar das comunidades locais. Então, ah, decidimos estabelecer a o que é a cadeia de valor de terras comunitárias para justamente criar esta capacidade que permite todas as partes interessadas discutirem em pé de igualdade e encontrarem mecanismos de ganho-ganho. E por isso ah, criamos o, o, o Cavateco. O, o Cavateco tem uma particularidade porque tem um elemento adicional que é a uh, cadastro popular. O cadastro popular oferece a possibilidade de documentação dos direitos das comunidades mais fácil, sem muitos custos e não representa nenhuma colisão mal do governo. E o que nós esperamos é que o cadastro popular vai alimentar o sistema formal de cadastro popular, de cadastro nacional de terras de Moçambique. Um aspecto muito importante também é que a, a nível das mulheres nós notamos grande entusiasmo e pensamos que é preciso continuar a reforçar a inclusão das mulheres nas nossas sessões de sensibilização para ajudar essas mulheres a aprimorarem os conhecimentos sobre os seus direitos definidos na Constituição da República e na Lei de Terras. Atualmente, as equipas de campo estão a trabalhar simultaneamente com as associações comunitárias, ora criadas, também representadas por ambos mulheres e homens, 
assim como com, estamos a trabalhar com as famílias individuais, com o objetivo de consolidar a consciência sobre a igualdade de direitos de terra entre homens e mulheres. Portanto, agora nós estamos bastante encorajados porque os resultados mostram-nos claramente que há muita aderência das mulheres. Cinquenta e três por cento, ponto cinco das, das mulheres já registraram, tanto já manifestaram o seu interesse em registrar em nome delas. Então, uh, este é o grande enfoque que nós temos uh, sobre uh, o gênero e o posso Calisto, thank you so much. That was really, I had a second question for you, but you answered it already. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I hope you will stay with us as other speakers will for the, the panel session at the end. Uh, but for now, we're going to move on to the fourth of our countries today. We're going to move on to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there have been recent moves to entitle rural communities, um, I believe, to up to 50,000 hectares of surrounding forests. Um, which is quite a big move uh, in that very large forested country. Uh, so here's our film on the DRC. Early in 2020, our partners were busy preparing for the June launch of the Tenure Facility Backed Project, which will see communities be supported to make use of a new ministerial order on communal lands to secure 300,000 hectares of forest lands in Western DRC. With the arrival of the pandemic, however, already isolated villages found themselves more cut off than ever, as communities were locked down Schools closed, trucks carrying goods to market stopped running, and markets themselves shut down. Already, impoverished communities have gone hungry, and whilst there has been little spread of the virus itself, fear of its impacts have proved infectious. <laughs> Coronavirus n'a pas été, je crois, une maladie qui, qui a permis facilement à, à faire les choses, surtout en ce qui concerne les, les projets PASDEF, dans la mesure où et, Les activités des projets qui devraient commencer naturellement depuis début juin ont été impactées et sur l'ensemble des, des, des consortiums et particulièrement pour les, les, les 5C. La COVID des consorts est à des niveaux. Au niveau des, des, des organisations que nous sommes, donc les, les 5C, d'abord, nous nous sommes organisés à, à travailler dans un système, je dirais, en, en ligne. Et en utilisant aujourd'hui le moyen qui, qui semble être le plus approprié, entre autres moyens, on a utilisé Skype, on a utilisé Meet, tout ça, avec les collègues, ou, ou les mêmes Zoom, pour discuter, que ce soit entre nous, au sein du pays, donc au sein des, des consortiums, et même avec les partenaires au niveau du Nord. Our partners have been doing what they can to help, supporting communities to create and strengthen agricultural cooperatives to ride out the economic shocks providing seeds to combat longer-term food insecurity and further advice they felt was needed on the ground at that time. Ces gens de situation, nous avions sensibilisé les communautés pour avoir d'abord la, la culture des de parcs et, et des banques effectivement. Et je crois qu'aujourd'hui, les communautés maintenant sont conscientes que si on avait réservé quelque chose chaque fois en bas et que et, face à coronavirus, on pouvait revenir à ça et pour pour vivre ou survivre pendant À un moment donné. Nous avions sensibilisé aussi autour de certaines pratiques d'hygiène 
qui doivent nécessiter la collaboration de tous et, et que les habitudes, disons, depuis la nuit des temps qui existent à, à se toucher, à laver les mains ensemble dans, dans un bassin avant de manger, tout ça doit être brisé et, et que l'économie doit être à tous les niveaux, chacun doit être très efficient dans ses dépenses et en tout avoir l'essence d'économie. Inevitably, the project itself was delayed. Our partners had hoped to start mapping by now, identifying the up to 50,000 hectares that each community is entitled to register as communal land. Despite this, with restrictions starting to ease from August, staff have been brought on board and community consultations are underway. Our partners are showing the ability to adapt to circumstances to keep moving forward. Aujourd'hui, par exemple, nous sommes à une période où les premières activités du projet dans les 5C commencent à se faire, entre autres la sensibilisation des autorités politiques et administratives et la, de la même manière aussi la, 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 la première sensibilisation auprès des communautés ou la série de sensibilisation auprès des communautés. Alors que si on avait commencé au mois de juin, je pense qu'à ce, ce stade ou au jour d'aujourd'hui, on serait déjà peut-être à l'étape même des, des cartographies participatives pour certaines, certaines zones. Et nous n'allons pas nous décourager à cause du coronavirus, d'autant plus que nous continuons à vivre et que les communautés que nous, nous encadrons ou que nous accompagnons vivent. That was, a, that was a nicely optimistic piece there, I think. We have two speakers um, on DRC. Let me begin with uh, Carmel uh, Kifu Kieto, who's the National Programme Manager for the Support Project for Securing Land Rights for Communities. He's, uh, he is at the Support Centre for the Sustainable Management of Forests. Um, Carmel, please share with us in, in five minutes, if you would, your hopes for the project and perhaps for a new era of community forestry, if I'm not being too optimistic. Carmel, please go ahead. Merci pour la parole. Je crois qu'en ce qui concerne les projets PASDEF en République démocratique du Congo, qui est lié à la sécurisation des droits fonciers forestiers de femmes, des communautés locales et des peuples autochtones pygmées, et il est en train d'être implémenté dans cinq provinces de la République démocratique du Congo. Et je cite le Congo central, le Congo, puis le Maï Lombé et Silouangi et Maï et Kinshasa, qui est la province centrale. Et donc, euh, en rapport avec les bénéfices pour les communautés locales, nous dirons que ce projet a un intérêt très, très, très accru pour les communautés locales, dans la mesure où euh, il permet à la reconnaissance juridique des droits des possessions coutumières des communautés locales, peuples autochtones et, et, et des femmes, mais également il permet la gestion durable à travers l'exploitation rationnelle des ressources naturelles, et, mais également la reconnaissance ou la connaissance parfaite des ressources naturelles disponibles sur la tenue à travers l'exploitation multi-usage. Il permet également aussi la participation des femmes et des peuples autochtones à la gestion des ressources qui sont les leurs et la matérialisation des limites et de la tenue à travers la cartographie participative. Et il faut dire aussi que ce projet va permettre dans une certaine mesure la cohabitation et la cohésion et même la paix sociale, tout en réalisant les, les conflits fonciers et forestiers qui existent non, non obstant à travers les pays et dans la plupart de, de nos zones. Mais également aussi, et il va permettre de développer un certain nombre d'expertises locales à travers les, les renforcements des capacités des, des uns et des autres au niveau et local et même au niveau national et provincial. Mais également, il faut chiter par dire que ça, ça nous permet aussi à valoriser les ressources naturelles et les savoirs endogènes des, des des peuples autochtones pygmées, des femmes et des, des communautés locales de manière, de, de manière la, la plus large possible. Et en ce qui concerne aussi eh, la collaboration au sein des, des consortiums ou des, 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 des membres du consortium, il faut dire que ces, ces projets ici eh, a jeté un certain nombre de jalons pour nous permettre d'être, eh, je dirais, en cohésion eh, au, au sein même du consortium. Et entre autres éléments à soulever, c'est l'accompagnement et le suivi à proximité des partenaires sur les terrains, mais également la communication permanente entre partenaires. Et il y a à souligner, à souligner aussi ou à soulever les renforcements des capacités des parties prenantes. Et il faut dire aussi que ce projet est à suffisance dans, dans la mesure où 
la mise en œuvre du plan de gestion des conflits au, au sein des cons, du consortium peut nous permettre de résoudre un certain nombre de problèmes qui peuvent intervenir ou qui peuvent surgir au cours de, de l'implémentation du projet entre parties prenantes ou entre les, les organisations qui sont dans les consortiums. Et il faut dire aussi que les échanges entre parties prenantes et surtout les partenaires du, du consortium est l'un des moyens qui va permettre à ce qu'il y ait une collaboration accrue et fluide entre nous, mais également les suivis scrupulés de, de l'accord des de partenariats entre parties prenantes ou entre les 5C. Voilà en quelque sorte ce que je pourrais donner comme quintessence ou quelques éléments de, de, que nous pouvons tirer de, de ces projets qui n'est qu'en son début. Et c'est à une phase préparatoire ou expérimentale. Et je crois que c'est maintenant que nous allons lancer sur les autres activités et en, en plein champ. Et ma collègue, je crois, elle pourra aborder une autre question ou aborder une autre question liée à, et au renforcement des capacités. Mais qu'à cela ne tienne, il faut dire que les droits fonciers des, des femmes, des hommes et des, et des enfants, et je dirais des communautés locales et des peuples autochtones, seront sécurisés à, à grande échelle, d'autant plus que... Nous n'avons pas une loi formelle pour ces pays qui, qui sécurisent déjà les droits foncés des communautés locales à, à ces jours. Nous ne sommes que dans la, la série des réformes. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, as you suggest, let's move on to uh, Serafine Ntumba, who's the gender officer for the support center. Um, Serafine, you place a lot of emphasis on building community capacity. Um, and Carmel just mentioned skills uh, to manage forests. So perhaps you can talk us through that a little bit. Thank you. Go ahead. Serafin, we cannot hear you. Would you please be able to unplug your earphones? Now all good. Okay, so now it's not? All good, please proceed, thank you. Oui, merci beaucoup. Donc, euh, je disais que euh, la RDC s'est lancée euh, lancé dans les processus de foresterie communautaire euh, euh, depuis 2002 et il s'est opérationnalisé en 2014 à travers un décret, euh, ce qui veut dire que le processus est nouveau. Euh, et donc, c'est l'une des raisons pour lesquelles euh, nous mettons l'accent sur euh, le renforcement de capacités. Euh, Mais à ces jours, je peux souligner que euh, plusieurs rapports euh, sur le renforcement de capacité, sur l'évaluation de besoins euh, de l'administration, des acteurs de la société civile, ainsi des communautés locales, euh, a soulevé euh, un certain nombre d'aspects, notamment l'inadéquation entre les rôles et les responsabilités attribuées à l'administration euh, forestière euh, en matière de foresterie communautaire, mais aussi les capacités euh, réelles de cette administration à pouvoir... Euh, assumer leur rôle avec efficacité. L'autre question, c'est les organisations accompagnatrices de, de communautés locales qui, elles aussi, disposent très peu de connaissances sur la question de foresterie communautaire. Et, et, et c'est ce qui, qui nous pousse un peu à, à mettre l'accent sur le renforcement de capacité et de, de communautés locales et de, euh, des administrations forestières, mais aussi... Euh, de, des organisations de la société civile, notamment euh, nos organisations du consortium dans le cadre de ce projet. Alors, la méthodologie que nous utilisons, en, en dehors du fait que euh, les rapports d'évaluation des besoins d'administration en charge de, de forêt a relevé un certain nombre de problèmes euh, en rapport avec les capacités de l'administration à pouvoir s'assumer avec efficacité dans leur rôle, euh, nous avons travaillé dans le cadre du consortium, dans le cadre de ce projet, Euh, sur une fiche d'identification de besoins de nos partenaires du consortium qui a euh, relevé un certain nombre de besoins euh, de, de, de partenaires que nous avons enregistrés euh, comme euh, des besoins prioritaires et que nous avons identifiés et, 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 et gardés comme, euh, euh, dans un plan de, de développement de capacités euh, techniques et organisationnelles euh, du, du, du projet euh, qui, qui, qui a commencé récemment. Alors, euh, lors de nos, de nos formations, nous mettons vraiment l'accent sur 
beaucoup de, de, de choses, entre autres, euh, nous remettant des kits pédagogiques aux participants, nous faisant des évaluations. Dans l'équipe pédagogique, par exemple, nous avons euh, les textes juridiques en rapport avec la foresterie communautaire que nous distribuons, euh, les guides imagés, les affiches, les fiches, les matrices de terrain, les modules euh, bien spécifiques de formation, ainsi que nous mettons aussi l'accent beaucoup plus sur les exercices pratiques en rapport avec ces formations. Mais aussi, il y a un élément qui, qui, que nous faisons aussi, c'est l'évaluation en fait, de besoins avant et après la formation pour s'assurer que euh, les participants ont bien assimilé euh, euh, les contenus de la formation et peuvent, après cela, bien s'assumer euh, sur le terrain avec les communautés locales dans leur accompagnement. Alors, euh, nous avons entre autres, parmi les thématiques et les modules que nous développons pour, euh, pour assurer... Euh, le, le renforcement de capacité, mais aussi pour assurer la prise en compte euh, de la cause genre euh, sur le terrain avec nos partenaires, mais aussi euh, ici chez nous à Kinshasa, au niveau du CHEDFT. Euh, nous avons, euh, entre autres, le, le module sur la diversité et l'inclusion euh, qui, qui, qui aborde un peu plus les questions d'équité euh, lors de la mise en œuvre du projet. Euh, il y a aussi les questions de, de peuples autochtones qui, qui, qui sont abordés aussi euh, lors de nos formations parce que nous avons l'un de nos sites qui est euh, un site mixte où on retrouve les Bantous et les peuples autochtones, donc les pygmées. Euh, il y a aussi un accent particulier qui est mis sur euh, la question du genre euh, sur le terrain. Donc, on, on voit là la participation communautaire de toutes les couches, euh, mais surtout, on met aussi l'accent plus sur les femmes, euh, les PA et les, les peuples marginalisés euh, lors de la mise en œuvre de nos activités sur le terrain. Un autre aspect que je voudrais souligner aussi par rapport au genre, c'est que, euh, euh, par exemple, pour le recrutement, nous avons euh, travaillé dans le sens où euh, il fallait assurer euh, l'égalité en fait, euh, euh, de chance lors du recrutement pour les candidats euh, euh, féminines aussi. Et donc, euh, par exemple, pour, pour l'unité de coordination du projet qui est basée à Kinshasa au CHEDFT, euh, nous avons 50% d'hommes et 50% de femmes dans, dans l'équipe du, du projet au niveau national. Mais au niveau des provinces, nous avons aussi euh, fait un effort de pouvoir recruter minimum deux, deux femmes dans l'équipe du projet sur, sur un maximum de six. Euh, donc, euh, et, et dans le lieu où on travaille avec les peuples autochtones, nous avons un animateur qui est, qui est, qui est pygmé, euh, qui travaille avec nous dans le cadre de ce projet. Euh, et donc, un autre, une autre thématique sur laquelle nous, nous mettons euh, l'accent, c'est aussi euh, le, le consentement libre informé préalable dans les clips euh, des communautés locales. Et donc, nous, avons, nous, nous donnons des leçons aux communautés locales en rapport avec leurs droits euh, aux clips, leurs... Euh, leur, ce qu'ils qu peuvent exprimer comme leurs besoins, en suivant bien sûr leur, leur processus de prise de décision, selon qu'ils qu sont déjà habitués au niveau local. Alors, euh, l'autre activité que nous faisons, c'est la cartographie, la cartographie participative des limites des de communautés locales. Donc, cette étape aussi qui demande euh, l'équilibre des communautés locales, mais qui demande aussi l'implication de, de, de nos partenaires au niveau de province. Euh, donc, euh, des modules de formation sont développés dans ce sens où on forme les communautés, on forme aussi euh, nos partenaires sur le, 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 sur le projet. Il y a aussi euh, la question des conflits qui est, qui est abordée suffisamment euh, dans, dans ce plan. Euh, et donc, euh, d'autres questions comme le leadership euh, et, et d'autres questions liées, en, liées au, au, au processus lui-même de foresterie communautaire qui... Euh, qui est assez complexe et, et, et sur lequel nous, nous mettons un accent particulier pour pouvoir avancer dans ce projet. Merci beaucoup. Seraphine, thank you very much. That was that was very concise. That was very good. Um, now uh, that is the um, the end of our national presentations. Um, a fascinating update, I think, on the scope and the successes and the the challenges of tenure facility supported work around the globe. So I thank all the speakers for that, but please stay with us because um, though we have scheduled a short break because we're running late, we're gonna go straight into the panel session now. So I hope that uh, most of our speakers are still with us uh, and will participate in that. So listen out in case you get called um, to answer some of the questions uh, sent in by the people listening to all this. Um, Our first question is for uh, Solange. So I, I hope Solange is there in Washington. 
Um, at least I think you're in Washington. Um, so excellent, I can see you. Uh, Solange, within the experience of working with women, I wonder if you've developed uh, for RRI or elsewhere um, indicators, process measurement indicators um, to see whether policies for women are working. Can we can we can we count the progress here? Yes, um, like I said in my uh, presentation. Um, RRI has uh, published um, a report called Power and Potential, and they have developed eight legal indicators looking into like constitution, inheritance, voting, governance, and within governance, look into participation, leadership. So those are the things that they look into community forestry, but uh, like I said, it can be applied to land. But not only that, but um, all these international instruments that I talked about and the national policies and law and the regional framework uh, related to land, they generally have uh, tools, indicators, and most of the government, they sign in, into those international and regional instruments and, and, and indicators. But the problem is the lack of accountability. Who is really following with the government to ensure that those indicators that they sign on are really like, you know, put into effect. And I believe that the tenure facility project that are really working on implementation of national laws should also see how those national laws relate to the international framework and how they're trying to implement those indicators and the tools that already exist instead of reinventing the wheel. It exists, it's about how do you tap into those, but also how do you hold government accountable to make sure that those laws, those tools and indicators are uh, put into practice. Are the indicators good enough to give you an idea of whether governments really are enacting these things? So can you kind of see it going on in real time over two, three, four, five years and see progress or is it too early for that? Well, you know, it all go again with uh, advocacy because we know that there's some resistance on, on the ground and also engaging with stakeholders when it comes to securing women's uh, community land rights. But it's about how do you engage people in dialogues? How do you build their capacities around these existing tools and make them see the interest and also the importance of securing that? And not like I said at the beginning, uh, for example, when I was working in Liberia at the beginning, when they were working around the land law, people, when you talk about women's land rights, people were, uh, would say, well, we're fighting a bigger battle. But how do you make people believe that, that within that bigger battle, women's like, you know, securing the rights of women is part of it? So I think once people understand that, it will be easy. Of course, it does take time. But like I said in the chat, if from the inception, of the project, like when you drafted the concept note, when you draft the proposal, those indicators are included, like, and very, like, you know, disaggregated. Then that way, when it comes to implementation, gender would not be an add on or an afterthought. And generally, that's what we are seeing in many projects. People wait until they start and start saying, well, oh, we need to, like, you know, add women. And what you will see is either this, this like, you know, these buzzwords that they would add in to please the donor. But in reality, is it really happening? So how do you really avoid this afterthought, this add-on approach and develop a comprehensive approach on how to engage? Then that way, it will help with the sustainability of the project because you done it from the beginning. But if you wait until the end, I mean, it, it's of course would not really last long. Okay, thank you. That's, that's, that's good advice. Thank you very much. Um, can I move on to India, to uh, Shweta now, if I may? Um, can you talk to me about what strategies are being incorporated in, in the project that you're working on to address the patriarchal culture, to stop this being a, talking about uh, gender rights being a sort of uh, a tick box exercise? What is actually happening? How are you addressing the patriarchal culture in India and supporting women's land rights? Am I visible? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so as I said that uh, there is the Forest Rights Act in India. So that has several provisions focusing on women, women's rights as well. And the law provides equal rights to women as owners. 
Although the act itself has not yet enabled women to participate in the public domain actively due to a lack of awareness of rights and regulation and poor societal acceptance of gender roles in governance. It is therefore, we feel that a mandate to adopt a methodology that involves the deep penetration of awareness, training and access to information that, ha that has to be of course facilitated through government agencies, industries and community-based organizations has to be further facilitated by the project itself in India. And to address the current gender gap, the forestry sector also must continue to help mainstream gender in forestry policies, such as women's effective participation in forest committees and must work with program and project leaders to address this challenge. So that is how we feel and uh, we feel that uh, we would like to work to ensure that the issues of intersectionality in women's leadership also uh, is addressed and advocacy for effective policies, networks, while strong institutional arrangements and capacity building are some processes that we would definitely like to focus on in India. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. That's very, that's very concise. Thank you very much. Um, can I move on to uh, Dr. Passang now in, in Nepal? Um, I'm interested in the, or we have a question asking about the relationship, the collaboration between forest user groups and indigenous peoples. Um, and I must say, I'm not very clear about, about how that collaboration works. And perhaps if you could also talk about um, the role of women in contributing to the strengthening of this relationship. Dr. Passan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fred. And thank you for the questions. Um, the, uh, the collaboration with the community forestry uh, in, in, the, in Nepal is uh, also an opportunity for indigenous peoples. Um, as as uh, we have also saw already uh, uh, heard, uh, they, we have seen the story that uh, they, uh, how uh, they, uh, most of the forest in the, in the Nepal is uh, already managed from the community-led uh, initiatives. So, uh, however, uh, because and also from the uh, our uh, government, we have also heard that uh, you know the policy and pro, uh, policy and the forest act and the forest policy and strategy is all the also on the way in in line with the in the addressing the uh, community uh, rights, right? So, however, uh, those uh, forest act and also uh, especially in the uh, in the, um, the federal structures in the context of the Nepal in line with the new constitution of Nepal. Now uh, they, there's a, a legal provision of uh, developing the uh, local rights, uh, local uh, laws uh, by the uh, local governments. So uh, in the context of, and then another part is the provision of the developing the uh, local forest act at the community levels, especially in the, in the community forest users groups that uh, has a provision of developing their own uh, policy and programs in line with the uh, local laws. So we, we, we would like to take that opportunity for indigenous people to uh, address that indigenous people's customary uh, governance system, indigenous people's uh, fundamental uh, human rights of continuation of their traditional livelihoods, um, our uh, and, and uh, 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 promotion and uh, recognition of our uh, traditional knowledge and our cultural practices and spiritual values uh, ties with the uh, uh, forest and also uh, the different resources. The one of the challenges with us we have been facing uh, not only in the community forestry uh, but also in whole whole forest, uh, forest uh, regime that uh, 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 in, including the conservation and national park and community forestry that uh, not been recognized for customary institutions as uh, one of the main key part of the governance system that contribute for sustainability of the natural resources as well as the sustainability of the livelihoods. So uh, the, this collaboration with the community forestry uh, governments and also other stakeholders, we are really hopeful for, uh, for um, moving ahead with the empowerments of the uh, key uh, government decision makers for recognition of customary uh, governance of indigenous people in the natural resource management that would help not only for the continuation of our traditional livelihoods, but also for protection of our knowledge system, our skills, our values that has been contributing for generation for the natural resource management and that contributed for climate change adaptation and resilience and then uh, addressing all these uh, uh, climate 
crisis. So, and then, and also uh, giving the opportunity for the continuation of our knowledge system, our spiritual and our cultural values to the future generation, so that there will not be you know, another, uh, you know, um, uh, continuation of the social exclusion and historical marginalization of indigenous peoples, women's, indigenous women's, uh, and then that forced the many indigenous youth and uh, men and uh, male and, uh, you know, um, you know, to go to the foreign employments or the cities, and uh, because there is no option even in the pandemic to continuation of the traditional uh, livelihoods, because there's no any access to the resources because of this. Uh, not So with this uh, partnership in the collaboration with the government and FECOFON and all stakeholders, we are really hopeful that uh, recognition of our customary governance, recognition of indigenous people rights uh, in the local laws, so that enjoyment of continuation of our traditional knowledge and practices will will move on uh, to be practiced by the future generation. Thank you, Dr. Passan. Just your queries. Sorry, uh, maybe I missed something. <laughs> no, no, that's that's excellent. But you mentioned um, in, and I know you've been busy on on climate policy, and you mentioned that in in, in your answer just then. Uh, just very briefly, I wonder if you think climate policy can be useful in in work for indigenous peoples, particularly in forest environments. Well, the climate change policy in the context of Nepal is very, very challenging because the climate change policy has not uh, really explicitly mentioned about the indigenous people's rights. There's a very, very small, very uh, kind of a, um, uh, overshadow kind of a provision is there in the climate change policy of Nepal that says like, uh, you know, traditional governance is, can be one of the uh, approach of climate change resilience. So uh, to have a, a further uh, moving ahead with the research and policy, but there's no any kind of uh, explicit, uh, uh, you know, indication in the climate change policy of Nepal that indigenous people's knowledge system, our values and cultural, in fact, contribute for climate change adaptation mitigation. So it's very important for empowerment of indigenous people, empowerment of women groups for enhancement of these practices in the for the future generation. So actually, this is a very big uh, challenge for indigenous people because still now the none of the policy explicitly mentioned on the important role and contribution of indigenous people. But as you have already seen that different uh, research and poly, uh, research, including IPCC and also intergovernmental different research and bilateral uh, research, including RRI research and World Bank, that uh, you know, only the 10% of the indigenous people's legally recognized territory had contributed already for more than 80% of the biodiversity, more than 25% of the carbon stock and more than 40% of the climate change resilience. But this fact is hardly been reflected in our climate change policy or its national strategy, forest strategy or forest act. So that is what uh, we are really taking opportunity for TF uh, projects that to uh, to uh, empower not only indigenous people or indigenous women, but also empower our government bodies, our other stakeholders on the values and role and responsibility have carried out by the indigenous peoples and particular indigenous women. Fred. Okay, Th thank you very much for that. That's most interesting. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Mozambique now, to uh, Calisto, um, and I wonder if you can tell me um, whether there are many women in, we have a question from our audience about whether there are many women in leading roles in the project in Mozambique, and what is their role um, to support uh, achieving the project goals? Over to you. Obrigado. Sim, um, as mulheres têm uh, um grande papel. Uh, primeiro, uh, este é um exercício muito complexo, porque um, nós estamos num país com alguma diferença de características. Temos no sul uh, com, com uma característica patrilinear e temos no centro e no norte com característica de linhagem matrilinear. E nós estamos a trabalhar na região norte de Moçambique, em que a, a característica de linhagem é basicamente matrilinear. Portanto, as mulheres têm de, têm de grande poder para, tanto para sobre a terra que, que, que elas têm. O que significa que quer dizer, os homens têm menos poder do que as mulheres. Agora, como tornar possível que as mulheres façam parte da gestão, do, 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 das associações e das estruturas de gestão comunitária? Primeiro, nós aqui vamos saber que temos o quadro legal, é favorável. O quadro legal defende que as mulheres têm igual direito de acesso e gestão de terra. Depois, temos a questão da sensibilização. 
esta sensibilização é a chave fundamental. Em todas as fases da nossa intervenção, o primeiro passo que nós temos é a sensibilização. E a sensibilização começa com a liderança comunitária, até chegarmos às famílias, até chegarmos às pessoas de forma individual. Um, e também nós aproveitamos muito as práticas locais. Uh, sabemos que as mulheres são as que mais trabalham a terra. Então, nós juntamos todos esses elementos e conseguimos uh, convencer mesmo aqueles que resistem às mudanças, aqueles que pouco acreditam que a mulher pode ter direito à terra, elas aceitam. Aceitam por quê? Porque os homens, eles reconhecem que as mulheres têm um papel, porque são elas que fazem as machamas, são elas que fazem as colheitas, são elas que vão buscar a água, são elas que vão buscar a lenha que está na terra, nas florestas. Então, aí o homem não tem mais do que se não aceitar que, de fato, a mulher tem grande papel. Em segundo plano, as mulheres sentem-se integradas. As mulheres ficam a saber que, na verdade, elas têm muita importância no uso e gestão da terra. Então, sentem-se parte da terra. E isto tudo culmina com a integração dos interesses não é? das mulheres e dos homens nos planos de gestão da terra. E quando falamos de integração das mulheres nos planos de uso e gestão da terra, significa que as mulheres têm que ter uma parte da sua participação. E a tendência, o objetivo é que esta participação das mulheres seja igual àquela que é dos homens. Então, é desta forma que nós conseguimos, portanto, uh, trazer as mulheres, não é? Na, na, nas estruturas comunitárias, na gestão das mulheres, na tomada de, de decisões sobre os, os, as suas terras e os recursos que nela, nela existem. Thank you. That's that's a real story of empowerment. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to DRC now to uh, Carmel. Um, Similar kind of question, really, um, from our audience. How can women be empowered so that they are included within DRC in the community assemblies that are currently doing registration of community land? This is a real issue for right now. How can women be better included in that process? So, Carmel. Bon, l'intégration des femmes, je crois que dans les processus de foresterie communautaire et dépend de la manière dont on les conçoit dans, dans, dans un coin ou dans l'autre à travers le pays. Nous, nous avons des, des sociétés qui, qui sont matriarcales, par exemple, où la, la femme a plus des, 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 quoi, des, des, je dirais des, des responsabilités que les femmes. C'est le cas, par exemple, de la province du Congo central, où nous avons aussi et, et, quelques sites. Alors, dans, dans ces contextes-là, je crois que nous, nous avons aussi des lois aujourd'hui qui, qui sont en train de... De, 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 de faire monter de plus en plus la, le rôle de la femme. Je prends le cas de la loi sur la parité, je prends le cas de, de, de la loi sur les peuples autochtones pygmées qui, qui est aujourd'hui en évolution au niveau du Parlement et qui a été, et je dirais, quelque peu déjà adoptée au niveau du Parlement par la, la commission qui a été mise en, en, en charge pour cela. Et donc, je, je dirais, il y a quand même un certain nombre de, de évolutions. Mais également, je crois que Mme Solange, là, si, si bien rappelé à un moment donné, Nous avons dans six provinces la République démocratique du Congo déjà des, des édits et donc des lois provinciales, en fait, si je peux le dire, et qu'on appelle communément édits ici et qui, qui portent ces, ces grands plaidoyers sur les femmes et qui, qui montent en puissance. Et lesquels édits ont été, je crois, appuyés par le collègue de, de CEFLED, qui est une organisation féminine. Et donc, du coup, je peux dire que les femmes sont en train de monter vraiment en, en puissance. Et notre constitution aussi a jeté un jalon très important pour dire que les femmes devaient aller jusqu'à 30%. Et 30%, c'est déjà énorme. Donc, avoir, par exemple, les 3, 6, 6, 10. Et par rapport à ce que le pays a été, par exemple, en 1960, quand il y avait, quand on les, les, les des indépendances. Et cela déjà est, est une avancée significative pour cela. Et au sein aussi des...
Oh, let's wait let... a moment, see if we if we get him back. Yeah, I think we lost his connection. Let's wait a few seconds. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, I think we're going to have to stop there. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't hear all of Carmel, but um, but I think we got the gist of what he was saying. So look, we're a couple of minutes late anyway, so um, let, I, I think we'd better say that the time for our panel is up. Um, I hope most of your questions that you put in were answered. My apologies if they weren't, but uh, we do our best. We have more content to come, so please stay tuned, but this is the end of my moderating of the, uh, the panels and national sessions. I'd like to thank all of the speakers over the past three days for a really fascinating tour of tenure issues in the, in the time of coronavirus. And also because they're often forgotten, even though they're absolutely vital to events like this. In fact, the better they do their job, the more they're forgotten, I would say. I'd like to thank all of our interpreters. Um, so I hope they carry on interpreting this, um, these thanks. Uh, we're not in a room together to applaud them, but I hope you will join me in virtual applause of the, uh, the interpreters as well as the speakers. Uh, but now for the, final, for the final 20 minutes, I'm gonna pass on the baton um, to our closing presentations and first to Joan Carling, who as most of you will know, is the uh, advisory group chair at the Tenure Facility um, and she's going to have some reflections um, both on today, but I think more generally on the last three days. So I'm going to buy out, bow out now and Joan, please take over. Uh, thank you. Thank you to, um, for allowing me to, to join this very rich um, discussions and presentations from the tenure uh, facility. I, I, I'm I am quite overwhelmed with the richness of uh, the experience from the different countries uh, that the tenure facility works. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear that in this session on gender, we actually have men talking about their work with women and empowering them and, and securing their la land rights. Uh, that's, I, I, I think, uh, sort of getting out of the box <laughs> uh, approach to, to this um, issue. So uh, if I may say the, the discussion today has been uh, very uh, rich uh, in, in highlighting the importance of community land rights, uh, including under the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and that uh, women uh, play an important role. Uh, in addressing this issue, this this pandemic, but also face uh, several challenges, as as our speakers have uh, quite hi highlighted. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of of actions, and initiatives, and efforts um, from the partners to um, to empower women and make them give them a central role in securing uh, land rights. Now, my, I just want to share some reflections on, on, on this particular issue, which uh, I, I think um, all have also uh, considered. I, 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 I think when we're, one, when we're talking of, of, of community land rights and women's land rights, um, there are intersection of international human rights frameworks uh, that are used uh, in relation to this. So we have, for example, the, in, in, uh, the rights of indigenous peoples um, as affirmed by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then we also have the rights of women under CEDAW. And just recently, we also have the declaration on, on, on peasants, and, and that includes uh, a lot of the communities, I suppose, that, that we're, we're talking about. And then we also have some voluntary guidelines that were mentioned, like the VG, VGGT, which is also being applied at the, at the national level. So I, 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 everybody, I think a lot of the speakers has, have highlighted the, the legal framework, even at the national level, as a good opportunity. Um, at the same time, we also are aware that the patriarchal system is still dominant in, in relation to so, social 
cultural context. And, and, and so we still see uh, the, the, the big issues in terms of uh, achieving uh, equality of, of men and, and, and women. And I un understand that that is the why everybody is focusing on empowerment of, of, of women. And I think we need to go beyond the issue of women having ownership not to, to lands because I, I think um, it's, it's, it's more also on the issue of participation of, of women in decision-making in relation to land use, land, uh, management uh, and conservation. And in, 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 in these aspects, they really play a critical role, but that, that is not acknowledged. Um, women are still invisible uh, in, in, in this context where they're actually the ones uh, being in the driver's seat in a lot of conservation uh, efforts. Uh, they actually also embody a lot of knowledge uh, for um, the, the use of our resources in, in more sustainable ways, but again, are, are made invisible. And I think these are also the points that we need to surface and, and, and also give more uh, um, prominence uh, and, and not just focus on, on of course, the, the importance of, of uh, access to, to land by, by women. The other thing that I also want to have clarity on when we talk of indigenous women's land rights is we're talking of two dimensions. One is the collective land rights of indigenous peoples, which is under the customary land rights. And that includes all, uh, all members. So from women, men, children, elderly, it's a collective. So women are very much part of that. And that's where um, I mentioned that women also have a critical role in, in should be given a critical role in management and, and, and decision making on, on the use of, of, of these lands. But within that is also uh, the arrangement of individual land rights. And that's also where there's a lot of question on, on, on the rights of women uh, under that. And, and I think that's also in a lot of mat matriarchal systems, women uh, are, are very much entitled, but majority are not. And, and it is, it is uh, uh, right that, 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 the, that women's land rights in that context should really be, be pushed. Uh, so, so that there is also bigger independence of, of, of indigenous uh, uh, women. So now uh, I'm also um, asked to reflect, I uh, provide some uh, points on building solid partnership with indigenous uh, peoples. And, and uh, from our experience in, in building partnerships, there are key, I, I want to highlight some of the key elements uh, and, and that has also surfaced uh, a lot in the, in the discussions. Uh, one is of course the, the need to, that the, the partnership framework should be anchored on the recognition, respect and protection of, of rights uh, of indigenous women and, and, uh, of, and, and indigenous peoples and, and, and communities and in relation to land territories and resources, but also the other related uh, rights, because you cannot just box land rights and, and not include the, uh, the bundle of rights, uh, as, as I, 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 I say it, um, individual and collective rights, because these are all interrelated uh, in, in our, our common framework of, um, of protecting the people and the planet. So we need to realize that these are in interlinked rights that, that we need to look at them also in its uh, uh, to, uh, inter, uh, in th their connection. So for example, when we were talking of, uh, of land uh, management of land rights, we need to also look at the indigenous systems, the governance that indigenous peoples have. And in, 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 in that regard, that's where the question of uh, indigenous women's participation is a challenge because a lot of the indigenous systems are, are do dominated by men. So in, 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 in that context, we need to push also for the equal participation of women in decision-making so that they're able to exercise their individual rights to participate 
in this broader um, collective rights or the self-determination of indigenous uh, people. So within that framework, like, like, like I said, you know, on a partnership framework, at the, at the very outset, we need to put women as equal to men. That, that, that should be part of the equation. Uh, and not just like one of the speakers said, an add-on, uh, right? And, and uh, the second point, and this is where women really uh, takes a, a higher ground, is the respect for the positive values and principles of, of indigenous peoples. And, and what principles are these? One is living in harmony with nature. That, that is uh, very much um, embedded in the lifestyle and management of uh, and governance of indigenous peoples. And this also includes the relations of reciprocity, interdependence, cooperation, solidarity. And also uh, when we talk of living in harmony with nature is the use of resources uh, according to needs and, and that we value resources uh, with uh, with the function that with the role and function they do uh, within our uh, environment and uh, and the relations of interdependence. So we do not look at them as as commodities, uh, but more as as resources to support our needs for this generation and also the future generations. So this this uh, holistic uh, view is is critical uh, to guide any kind of partnership with indigenous peoples. Otherwise, we will be imposing, and that's exactly what's happening, that the Western view of, of resources, that these are up for grabs, that these are, are well, the, the commercial, uh, um, that these are commodities that can be exploited for profit. And that's exactly what we're trying to prevent. Uh, and as, as we can see, that's the, why we're having this crisis now is because uh, we, we are working against nature than working in, in, in harmony with nature. Um, then, then as, as everybody has mentioned, the need to, uh, that the partnership should be empowering. And this means empowering both men and, and women. And we, since we know that women are the ones lagging behind, then we need to put special attention on how do we empower women. And the first step is to make sure sit, they have a seat on the table, that they are part of every decision making, that their perspective, their views, their aspirations are all accounted. Uh, that that is you know not just saying you know equality of men and women or saying empowerment. What do we actually mean by it? And that is the critical point that we engage them in decision making processes at all levels. And that we take you no know, we uh, we fully account for their perspectives, uh, needs, and aspirations. And second, this is that we, when we say empowerment of women, we also empower them politically, socially, economically, to be uh, to be independent as well. So because that is the uh, one of the of the factors of of the vulnerability of of women is that the lack, their lack of economic independence. Then uh, finally, is to uh, also to say that uh, we need to account for uh, under a partnership, not everybody is the same. So we need to account and address the specific conditions and needs of the, the most vulnerable amongst indigenous peoples. Uh, for example, the poorest of the poor, how do we also make sure that, that, that they, are, uh, they are included? Uh, women, uh, persons with disabilities and, 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 and the elderly and, and even children. I mean, we, we need to be more inclusive and, and recognize that this, the, 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 the differentiated needs and thereby uh, in, ensure that they are also part of, of the partnership so that their needs and aspirations are also um, uh, addressed and accounted uh, for. So uh, I, I, I think it's a, when we're talking of, of partnerships uh, with, with indigenous peoples, uh, I, I, uh, I, I believe that as, as I mentioned, it, the, the, the very framework of, of respect, cooperation, and solidarity uh, it, it should guide uh, the, the way we, we continue to, to relate 
with, with each other and that the partnership is also a process uh, and a platform for learning. And, and, and I think that's what's been happening with these three days is the learning from, from uh, the tenure facility experience. And when, when I say a platform for learning, that means we're open to this, to also risk uh, and we're open to accept risks and, and weaknesses and, and, and to learn from each other, to, to, to inspire each other and to, and to accept that we may have some different views but at the same time, we can still work together uh, on ba based on the respect for rights and based in, uh, on, on em empowering our communities and, and our peoples. And finally, upholding uh, the dignity of, of, of indigenous peoples in, in a respectful uh, manner. So I, I believe this learning uh, sessions have have taken note of that, and and that we are we all we we all feel uh, enriched uh, and inspired by all the efforts and initiatives of the tenure facilities, especially those who are working on the ground. And we shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes because that's part of partners of growing in, uh, uh, in in a partnership. The important thing is that we draw lessons and 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 we advance. Uh, and and I, I certainly believe that our we every, everybody's um, in in spite of the COVID that that we are in now, that uh, we are all still uh, in in the right track in advancing um, our common aspiration of securing land land rights for the people and and the planet. Thank you. Uh, Joan, fantastic words. Respect, cooperation, and solidarity are the three words that I took from that towards the end of your presentation. Now I'm handing over for closing remarks to Nonette. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Joanne. That actually was the closing three words uh, that is important for us to remember. Uh, today, we finally come to this particular moment. We're coming to the closing of the public uh, learning event. And for that, uh, I would uh, like also to acknowledge that tomorrow we have 100 uh, registrants for our internal partners learning. And that I would not be able to join that, but good luck to that. For these three days, I would especially thank the beautiful films that were developed closely with our partners. Yeah, the effort of our partners to, to, to submit on time and uh, get the, the views of what's happening in the field and share the narratives is highly appreciated and that they have done together and closely with our program officers uh, in the tenure facility. And um, the, the program team is very much a, um, actively tracking this and the communications team uh, of the tenure facility. And I will not name everybody because it will probably take a long time. But uh, with that, I, I deeply um, feel that the films communicated a lot and the, the sharing of direct experiences uh, to everyone here communicated a lot and it is low carbon, no, it's not even low carbon. It is no carbon. We did not have to travel. We did not have to, to uh, limit the people who can participate. We started with 180 to almost 190 participants. And then now we're still, still, we're still 125. Uh, that's much more, that's double than what we could afford if we, we came to, to, to travel. Uh, nonetheless, this, this I would like to emphasize also, the, the partners wanted this cross learning and exchange. And uh, eventually into the future, we realized that this, uh, this experience will help us balance what is doable online, what is really doable on direct uh, visits that will help our partners learn from each other. The, the principle of the support, uh, that's really the principle of our support, the tenure facility support, to the guardians of the territory and the holders of 
the responsibility for the landscape, the last remaining tropical rainforests and rainforests in the world that's intact uh, are really you. And so we pay the funds that are dedicated to do the work is very much a our what we can do so far. And it is what you do over, over these years have been so much. What you do is what is helping us manage the threats of our forests for all of us in the world, uh, manage those threats that are coming. So what you do to secure land rights is not just for yourselves, but for everyone. And so the, the lessons that have come up, their collaboration with government, the use of laws to, the, and implement them, the uh, creative uh, participation of youth and the use of advancing technology and commanding that and, and, and innovating and the women making those decisions actively, despite COVID had become very prominent in the stories. And that it, to us is something that is more than just a reward to the tenure facility, but to all, to all who have started doing this work from the very beginning, the defending land rights, um, doing legal reform and uh, partnering and our eye developing this idea and now has become an idea and become the tenure facility. And over time is really serving that purpose is a very good, um, example of a dream come true. But in fact, it is a responsibility that that uh, is very much our shared responsibility to the holders of the landscape. So the tenure facility uh, with our board, on behalf of our board, again, I would just mention Mirna, Don, Augusta, they're still here. Um, Andy, who is not quite uh, so busy today. Uh, Samuel, Abdon, um, Eleni, a Vicky, who is also still with us, uh, Juan Manuel, and our advisory group, Joanne, thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, there are many more members of the advisory group that are here. We have our support, support team here, the technical team, our translators, uh, who else that I have not mentioned, I apologize. Uh, this has been a, a beautiful time online and uh, very effective and we will make accessible for everyone who needs those films uh, to use. Uh, we will make, especially the partners who have really developed it, make accessible uh, for, 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 for your own use. Uh, and um, any more, uh, Paula uh, and your team, thank you very much uh, for the work here. Margareta and the program team, thank you. And our management uh, team, uh, Hannah and Christina, thank you. Um, who else? Uh, Fred, of course, <laughs> our moderator has been here with us for three days. Thank you very much. Um, I end this session now. <laughs>